Fazia on his second of his three-part series on Muslims and Alevi Armenians. Then the music lecture by Ian Nagoski and Harut Arakelian. And then finally again, Dr. Carol Bertram uh, in October. Uh, and then in November, we have uh, Dr. Papazian's third lecture. And then we have a special guest coming all the way from France, Dr. Claude Boutafian, who has just written a new book about the Armenians in Jerusalem. And he'll be here to speak about Armenians in Jerusalem. So you can see our, our lecture series is pretty varied in terms of uh, the kinds of materials that we're covering. You can always go on Facebook and on our um, homepage to be able to, uh, to, to follow our events. So I'm going to switch so that we can go to our speaker. So I'll do that. Okay. So is everybody comfortable? You don't have to worry about parking tonight because it's Friday night. And so Friday afternoons and Saturday and Sunday, there's free parking at Fresno State. But on the Thursday lectures, uh, you have to get a parking permit, but mm -hmm. our students will be out there. To, to be able to, to get that. So are, are we on, Andrew, with the uh, online? Okay. So good evening once again. Uh, welcome you to the Armenian Studies Program Fall Lecture Series. And as I mentioned to you, all of the upcoming events, but our guest this evening is Dr. Hrag Papazian, who is the Kazan Visiting Professor in Armenian Studies. That visiting professorship started in the year 2020, uh, 2000, 2000, yeah, 22 years ago, and our first professor was Dr. Richard Hovanesian, uh, who spoke uh, 22 years ago. And since that, we've had 18 other Kazan visiting professors. So Dr. Papazian is our 19th Kazan visiting professor. And the purpose of the le uh, visiting lectureship is that these professors will come, give three public lectures, but also teach a course, and then also do research in their area of interest. So it gives them an opportunity to devote time to uh, research as well as to get experience teaching uh, a class and then also sharing that research with you, the audience, for, uh, for the lecture. Tonight's lecture is called uh, The Christian Armenian Community. It's part of the three-part series which is called Armenians and quote-unquote other Armenians in contemporary Turkey. And so he'll talk tonight, Dr. Papazian will speak tonight about the Christian Armenian citizens of Turkey and uh, how they survived and organized, especially since the founding of the Turkish Republic uh, in 1923. So the modern Republic of Turkey was established in 1923, and uh, he'll be talking about that. I'll let him give the talk, I won't introduce more, but I'd like to introduce a little bit more about him. Dr. Papazian earned his doctoral degree in anthropology from the University of Oxford. And his dissertation was about Armenians in contemporary Turkey. He spent two years, I believe, in Turkey uh, doing extensive research uh, on this topic. He's a native of Lebanon and has lived recently in Armenia. So he's pretty much an international Armenian, as most Armenians are, right? I asked foreign Armenians. His thesis uh, received an honorary mention in the Society for Armenian Studies Distinguished Dissertation Award. And before coming to Fresno last semester and last year, he was a Promise Armenian Institute postdoctoral fellow at UCLA. So he spent the last year at UCLA. And he's also been a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge and an adjunct lecturer at the American University of Armenia. He'll be in Fresno until uh, December, at the end of classes. Uh, I'm happy to introduce also his wife, who's here, Nune. Please uh, wave your hand at least and let everybody see you. That's Dr. Papazian, Mrs. Papazian, who's here also. Thank you. So it's my pleasure, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Hrag Papazian. Dr. Papazian. part is about the Armenians, so not the other Armenians. I'll come to it in a second. So 
Um, that is the Christian Armenian community uh, in the Republic of Turkey. I will go. I will cover the history, of course, but um, my research is and my topic is uh, the contemporary times. Um, I will start by. I will start by showing you something else. So uh, this is a short um, a animated somehow um, graphic uh, story um, about my research drawn by uh, Nuna and my spouse. Uh, we did this together. Um, so it's, it's also titled Armenians and Other Armenians in Turkey. It was published um, two years ago uh, on, uh, in a, it was called Illustrating Anthropology. It was by the Royal Anthropological Institute uh, in the UK. So um, I'm going to, so it's a, it's a five page thing. Um, I will go over three of the, three, three of the pages today, uh, leave the two others uh, for the two other lectures. So this is, uh, this is a neighborhood uh, called Fatih uh, in Istanbul, in contemporary Istanbul. And this building is a Han. A Han uh, Hans are uh, business centers, basically. Um, and this is, this is absolutely real. Um, so Besra, uh, only the names are changed. Besra is a Christian Armenian uh, citizen of Turkey. 47 years old. She works here, there at the top. Uh, she and her brothers run a jewelry workshop. She was born in Iskenderun in southern Turkey. Now on the same floor, uh, no, a floor below, there's Yusuf, who's a Muslim Armenian. That's how he identifies himself. He says, I'm a Muslim Armenian. I'm a Muslim Armenian. Um, he's 55 years old. He works here with his cousins, who also own a jewelry workshop. He was born in Batman, historical Sassoon, um, in southeastern Turkey again. And then he came, his family came to Istanbul. And then on the same floor as Besra, there is Artur, who's a migrant from Armenia, uh, 33 years old. Uh, so a citizen of the Republic of Armenia, but who has come to Turkey, uh, and he works here. He's employed by Besra's family. Uh, he was born in the town of Ararat, in neighboring Armenia. So these three types of Armenians, I would say, um, they live and they work every day in the same Han here, uh, but they symbolize somehow um, the situation of generally uh, 
contemporary Armenians and contemporary Armenianness in Turkey. So these three types or three factions of Armenians today uh, live in Turkey, and this is this has been uh, the result of what I call a diversification of Turkey's Armenian population, which started after the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, I will cover next time how the Muslim uh, and also Alevi Armenians emerged publicly as a second you know, faction of Armenianness, and then. Uh, during the third lecture, I'll cover how the migrants started to arrive. Uh, but what my whole research looks at is how they relate to each other, how do they understand each other or do not understand each other, how do they treat each other, whether they accept or reject or question each other's Armenianness, and what does Armenianness mean? Uh, the question comes up uh, from within all this, you know, um, all this. Uh, all this coexistence, and here's, a, here's the last, so the last page of our graphic ends as follows. So let's start from the left. Um, so Besra, the Christian Armenian, is asking, Muslim or Armenian, how can one belong to two opposing sides at the same time? Yusuf responds, see, we're not only excluded from the Turkish or Kurdish nations as quote-unquote Armenian bastards, and we'll come to this uh, in October, but also from the Armenian one for, for being Muslim. But it's the Muslims who massacred us in 1915, says Bestra. Yusuf says, no, genuine Islam opposes those killings. It was racism, the same racism that oppresses us, Muslim Armenians, too. Let them get baptized first and become Armenian again, says Bestra. And Yusuf goes, Armenians have been Christian for only 1,700 years only. Were they, were they not Armenians before? Armenianness is a race, he says, not a religion. And Bestra says, to me, they're just Turkey fuck. And then Arthur comes in, into the picture. Who? Who? Our Yusuf? I didn't know he was Armenian. I always knew him as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. I like Besra, he says, but let me be frank. I have issues with Istanbul Armenians. I mean, they're really nearly Turkified. They're always ready to deny their Armenianness, lest they get mistreated by the Turks. Some even deny the genocide, he says. Besra responds, Migrants said that? They have no clue what it means to be an Armenian here in Turkey. Besides, they have nothing to lose. They can always return to their country, but we have nowhere else to go. We belong here. They think, Arthur says, that going to the church is enough to make them Armenian, and they remain indifferent towards Armenia. How did this become their homeland, and how did Armenia cease to be? And then, Besra, we have always been in Anatolia. Even Arthur's ancestors were ex exiled from here. And yes, that ch changed them a lot. They are somehow Sovietized, Russified. So, this is the picture I would be speaking about, but today's lecture and so each and every lecture is intended to somehow try to explain uh, this clash of different Armeniannesses and where this comes from. So why does Besra, of course this is, you know, this is a generalization, not all, and I really think a Christian Armenian thinks like this and speaks mm -hmm. like this, but why does this appear as a dominant, you know, dominant, um, as a dominant, perhaps example within the Christian Armenian community. So what are the historical but also contemporary contextual um, characteristics and facts and factors that have shaped this type of understanding of Armenianness, which is which finds it very which finds you know Muslim Armenianness to be very problematic. And the same with the uh, other cases. So today's um, lecture is devoted to the Christian Armenian uh, community, the traditional Christian Armenian community. In uh, in Istanbul, um, and so I start. Uh, I, I read this page, and then I move to the uh, to my slides and uh, proceed with with those. So Besra says, "I'm an Armenian. I'm a Christian. For us, those two are pretty much the same thing. An Armenian should necessarily be Christian. That's what I've heard since I was a child. In Iskenderun, we only experienced Armenianness in small rituals and prayers at the church. Almost nothing beyond that. Later on in Istanbul, I learned some Armenian." I learned that we have our literature, our music, and so on. But religion and church are really at the core of our identity. And it has always been so. We are the first nation to adopt Christianity, right? We sacrificed ourselves for Christianity, first in 451, the Vartanans War, then in 1915. As our young priest explains, Armenianness is the body, Christianity is the soul. It's an indivisible unity. Besides, the Turkish state does not recognize us in any other way either. Armenians are a religious minority, just like the other non-Muslims, the Greek.
Greeks and the Jews. Okay. So as I said, today's lecture is mainly devoted at understanding why, um, why, do, so what are the underlying reasons for most, if, uh, many if not most, Christian Armenians to not to be at ease with the idea of Muslim Armenians. Um, in order to understand that, we have to first of all look at the state's understanding, the Turkish state's understanding and categorization of Armenians and of Armenianness um, from above. So legally, officially, how is ident the Armenian identity in the Republic of Turkey being uh, drawn, categorized, described, uh, configured somehow? And for this, we have to go uh, back to 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne, which was the treaty that uh, established, basically, the Republic of Turkey. Um, it was with this treaty that the Republic of Turkey was you know, recognized as a newly emerging nation state uh, by the Allied powers, and there there was there were debates during those during the treaty you know during the during the discussions, and the Allied forces, Britain, France, Italy, and so on, were uh, pushing for the recognition of ethnic and religious minorities uh, that had survived the genocide, including the Armenians. Um, these these identities to be recognized as uh, as minorities and for them to have you know particular rights and protection and so on. But the Turkish side did its best to resist to this, um, and there was a compromise at the end, and the compromise was that uh, we acknowledge religious minorities, period. So no ethnic minority as such recognized. That is why the only mention of minor, the only times that um, the word minorities, minority or minorities comes up in the Treaty of Lausanne, is it's always preceded by the word non-Muslim. Uh, so, all minorities in Turkey, recognized minorities, are the non-Muslim minorities. These are mainly the Armenians, the Greeks, and the Jews. In other words, the millets uh, that used to exist in, the, in, in, in Ottoman times. So, the Kurds, for instance, were not recognized as, a, no, as officially not recognized as a minority, because they are Muslim. The Circassians, the Cherkes, uh, similarly. The Arabs, similarly. Uh, so, this was, this was within the logic of, you know, Creating a newly, you know, newly, uh, newly emerging, you know, Turkish nation states. So as much homogeneous as possible. Uh, so the homogenization and Turkification of the remaining population. So part of that project was was done and accomplished thanks to or with with the genocide by the genocide, right? By eliminating these others of of, of the Turkish, uh, you know, of Turkish identity. And so the the task now after establishing the new republic was to uh, try to homogenize as much as possible and create that new nation, new community of Turks. Um, in that context, so the only minorities, and including the Armenians, were, as I said, cited and described and defined as non-Muslim minorities. So in and of itself, the definition of them as a special category or as a special group um, of citizens living within the Republic of Turkey was religious somehow. Um, and this is very obviously shown in um, old uh, identity cards or identi identity documents of them. This, I, I photographed this because I, I, when I found it um, in, uh, in the association of Sivas, Sefasti Armenians in Istanbul. Um, and this is an old identity card in which um, you see the name, uh, family name, father's name, mother's name, um, where he was born, Sivas. Um, and then it's, there's, I've encircled with red, it's Dini, which means religion, Ermeni. Armenian. So we see to what extent Armenianness is already from the very beginning perceived and portrayed and described and categorized as a religious identity, as a religious denomination. And the same thing to some extent um, has survived until our days, at least 
on public dis in public discourse. Now, no more this is the case. So you don't see Dini Ermeni. So now, after after after after years, this was changed, and uh, Dini would be Christian, Christian, Christian. So that that distinction was had come. But this shows us the logic, the underlying logic. And to date, uh, oftentimes when they speak about the Armenian community, they, they use the word Jemaat. So Ermeni Jemaat. And this this is a, just a screenshot from independent uh, Turkish version of independent. Um, and there you see they have a, a whole you know tag. Ermeni Jemaati. So everything related uh, to the Armenians of Turkey comes under Ermeni Jemaati, which is Armenian Jemaat. Jemaat is in and of itself again a very religious word. It's, it means a congregation. It means a religious community particularly. So it's not Ermeni Halka, for instance, like Armenian people. But it's not Ermeni, I don't know, um, Ermeni Mileti even, which, which can have the sense of a nation or of an ethnic identity. So that, on the, on the one hand, we had religious categorization from above. So the Armenians growing up, being born, uh, you know, living in the Republic of Turkey, are seen officially not as an ethnic minority, uh, not as a national in the sense of ethnic minority, uh, but or a racial minority, but rather as a religious one. Second, and parallel to this, these people have been throughout history discriminated against and otherized so treated, excluded, again based on there being non-Muslims, particularly. Um, called Gaidi Muslim, meaning literally non-Muslim. And so these are only a few historical, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, the most famous, quote unquote, historical um, incidents during which Armenians, together with the other non-Muslims, and this is key, so they were sorted out and they were differentiated based on their non muslim Rather than there being, you know, ethnically Armenian, which and, and there are, you know, theories of in sociology and anthropological theories argue that uh, discrimination, eventually, you know, the way you are discriminated against, uh, impacts your own understanding of yourself to some extent after, you know, on a long-term basis, right? So if they keep discriminating you on the basis of your uh, skin color, you would eventually realize more and more, or perhaps understand more and more that you are seen differently or as different in terms of your skin color and hence perhaps identify yourself also differently based on that. Now in this case, um, the Armenians, these you know, um, large scale discriminatory events that they went through and that, that they still remember <coughs> to this date, that, that this comes up in almost every single interview I, I have had with local Armenians, uh, Christian Armenians living in Istanbul today, um, they see this and they share this history with the other non-Muslims again. And so the first one is the incident of 20 classes in 1941. The 20 classes, Yirmi Kura, these were special battalions that were created during the, uh, during the Second World War. Uh, in these battalions, only non-Muslim citizens were included, were conscripted. So Muslims would go and would bear arms, would go into you know, ordinary, normal battalions. But the non-Muslims were seen as non-reliable, so they could not come, you know, they could not be part of the, uh, of, of the official recruitment of the army. So they have created a special battalion for them, which was basically a labor battalion. So forced labor, uh, they were taken and they were, uh, they were taken and they were, you know, they, they, they worked on roads and so on and so on. Basically uh, exploited, their labor was exploited. And even in quite harsh conditions, um, and as I said, they were only, again, non-Muslim people, Greeks, Muslim, uh, Greeks, uh, Armenians, and Jews. Then a year later, there was the property tax, Varlak Ferguson, which is again a very famous um, happening incident in the history of the Republic of Turkey. And these, these were again, taxes uh, with the purpose of you know, raising funds uh, in the context of this Second World War, and so crisis situation, uh, like everywhere in Turkey as well. But again, this was very obviously and legally had, you know, it was, this, it was implemented in a way that I mean, you know, all non-Muslims, so there was a category called Muslims, they had to pay about 5% of their property wealth as a tax, one-time tax. So those was the, the, were the Muslims. When it comes to the non-Muslims, they had completely, you know, different rates that they had to pay. Um, these even surpassing 
it's absurd, but that is the case. Now, there was a differentiation within that in the case, in the sense that there were the Jews, so higher than the Muslims, then the Greeks, then the Armenians, but nevertheless, again, the, the, you know, the, the, the larger separation was between Muslims uh, and, and non-Muslims. So you would identify yourself again, so you would see that you and your Greek neighbor, because you're non-Muslims, you are being uh, taxed on a much higher rate. And this is termed by some scholars as an economic genocide, um, as, as a second wave of you know, economic uh, appropriation, uh, and so on and so on. And then there was the pogrom of September 6-7 in 1955. This was a pogrom that initially tar started targeting the Greeks, um, based you know, related to the events, events in Cyprus. Uh, but it immediately, so in the streets of Istanbul, but also in other large cities, uh, Greek businesses were attacked, looted, people were also killed. Uh, but Armenians and Jews, because of being, again, non-Muslim, because of being Yabush, meaning infidel, uh, a word that has been used for centuries, but is still in, in, in daily usage, uh, even on you know, Turkish TV and so on. So because of being Yabush, just like the Greeks, their businesses were also targeted. So 17%, uh, there's a number, uh, according to some statistics, 17% of all businesses looted uh, and you know, destroyed of shops being destroyed, 17% again belongs to the Armenians. So again, going through all these, Armenians of Turkey would see, you know, um, you know, decades and years and years over, that they are seen as different and they are targeted as being non-Muslims. Not just as non-Muslims, also because also as Armenians in particular, because as I said, the Armenian for the, the rate, the tax rate for the Armenians was much higher. But nevertheless, they come within this whole group of the others, which is the non-Muslims, the Gairus, the Gairus. And these are much, much more you know, recent. Um, these both date May 2020. Um, and these are attacks on Armenian churches in Istanbul. So this is something that, happen, that, that is very common. It happens very often. So once a year, once every two years. Um, this, this one is the Sufa Svalazin Church in Bakurkeg. Someone had just come and tried to, you know, put uh, just put a blaze um, the the gate, and there there was it was videotaped. Someone just came and um, took the took the uh, crucifix away. So again, violence and anti-Armenian actions based on targeting the religion. So somehow making that religious factor uh, very relevant. So religious categorization from above, religious discrimination. Um, and on top of all that, there's, there comes what I call the suppression of trans-religious manifestations of Armenian identity. So uh, whereas the religious side of Armenian identity is discriminated against, what is trans-religious, so what, goes, what can go beyond religion, that is history, maybe nationalism, um, so ethnic manifestations and so on, is suppressed. Because that is really incompatible with the idea of Turkey, with the idea of Turkification uh, in the Republic, much more than so much more than religious, right? Um, this is again, um, this is a, a screenshot from a newspaper article published in 1938, um, and there are a few things that I have underlined here, um, and they speak about this facet. Um, first, we we'll start by this one, Mezheri Tivari Ermeni, which is which is the same thing, which is, which, is the, uh, which is about the categorizing from above. It means Armenian by denomination. So mezheb means literally denomination. It's not ethnic group, it's not racial group, it's not, it's religious denomination. So that we see again. So his, this guy, uh, an, the, the author of this article, is an Armenian by denomination. Otherwise, he's a Turk, or he's supposed to be a Turk in the, you know, within the project of Turkey. But then more importantly is the title and what this Armenian citizen uh, has written. And he, he's, he's calling upon his Armenian fellow Armenians, saying, Armenians, we should choose Turkish family names for ourselves. And he goes, it's a whole, the whole article speaks about Armenians in reality, ethnically, and, and even racially being Turkish, being Turks, but just being Armenian in terms of you know, denomination and in terms of religious difference. Now, of course, this is not his own, you know, uh, his own fantasy. Uh, it might be, but it is. It comes within a from within a context where this was it was this was encouraged. Um, this was 
uh, somehow, as I said, part of the plan of certifying the general population. So um, they could do away with the minority status of uh, Muslim, non-Turkish Muslims, like the Kurds and Circassians. They couldn't, under allied pressures, they couldn't do away with the religious difference. But then there was this attempt of keeping these others these others difference to the, at least to the religious level, and then trying to assimilate them, culturally speaking, and nationally into the nation of the Turks, although Armenian or Greek by denomination, but it's just denomination, it's not more than that. So this shows that Armenianness, yes, it's within, all within that project of not letting Armenianness transgress its strictly religious boundaries. And I've underlined there the Turk Armenians. I just noticed today, um, I had noticed earlier, that Turkey is capitalized. Ermeni is not capitalized. And it might be very symbolic. Uh, it might even be a title. I don't think so, though. Um, it, it, it, it symbolizes what I've just been telling, that the, the, the Turk, Turk identity is the you know primary identity. And then you can be Ermeni a non-capitalized Armenian, Armenian that, that's just a denomination. But don't go beyond that. If you go beyond that, you can get punished. So if you speak about the Armenian genocide, which is not going to the church and praying to God, so that's beyond the religious boundaries of permitted Armenianness, then you get punished. Even a year ago, like God of Ireland, the ethnic Armenian uh, MP in Turkish parliament, after speaking, was banned uh, from from Parliament sessions. And some of again, some of these policies that try, have tried or have, have have somehow attempted and to some extent at least successfully attempted at limit you at you know suppressing trans-religious manifestations or of Armenianness are evil. So one was the Vatandash Tirchekonush campaign in the 1930s. So this was a campaign started by young students in, uh, in Turkish universities and schools, um, but was eventually uh, very soon, uh, and in fact historians argue that it was all the way from the beginning sponsored by the state. So a state-sponsored campaign of basically um, trying to ban all other languages to be spoken in public, mm -hmm. except Turkish. And so vatandash to Czech means citizens speak Turkish. And there's a picture there uh, of a poster that reads, Vatandaş Türk Çekonuş, Konuşmayanık İkazet, Awaken or warn those who do not. And there have even been some municipalities who have actually you know, punished those who, spoke, who have spoken uh, other languages, on languages other than uh, Turkish in public. We can read here uh, in Gönen, which is a particular municipality uh, in Western Turkey, uh, the municipality uh, says speaking uh, uh, so languages other than Turkish is banned officially um, and he said they cite such, such languages that are spoken in Gunan. interestingly there is no Armenian here but the, uh, in I'm showing that particularly for that reason to show you that this is not this was not only against Armenians but this falls within the broader aim of as I said Turkifying the Gunan, culturally assimilating the whole population so Cherkesce, Gürcüce, so Georgian, Circassian, uh, and, and other languages uh, should be banned, and those who speak will be punished, okay? So that's one example. And then um, the question of history education. So usually Armenian diasporic in the diaspora, in Lebanon, in the Middle East, and so on, um, there are courses on Armenian history, right? Within the Armenian, Armenian community schools. That is not possible. The only uh, two, the only two um, courses you can provide within your community schools is religion, because Armenianness as a religious you know, denomination is permitted uh, by the Lausanne Treaty, and second, Armenian language, because lang language is also given permission, and you know uh, it has been, uh, yeah, as Lausanne mentions clearly that these these minorities, these non-Muslim minorities, have the right to pros pr profess their religions and speak there and learn their languages. So you cannot teach Armenian history. That's one, that's one example. So no course on Armenian history. Um, in history textbooks, all history textbooks, uh, so, that are, so the, history, the history courses within Armenian schools 
are always mandatorily taught by ethnically Turkish teachers. So, so that should be ethnically Turkish that teachers, uh, and the and the books used come come from you know um, are not produced by the schools themselves, but come from the uh, Ministry of Education, and they say nothing about Armenian past. So again, Armenian children do not learn about their history because there are no courses. Do not learn their history because the only course about Turkish history or the history of the Ottoman Empire um, goes without mentioning uh, Armenian existence before, you know, before the Ottoman Empire in those lands and so on and so on. The only uh, <coughs> times when they speak about the Armenians, they speak of the Armenians as the traitors who stabbed us from, from our back, and so we gave them a lesson. Um, and memories of the genocide, again, are suppressed. Uh, and under this pressure, under state pressure, and under public pressure, um, it's not like in other countries, in other diasporic centers, that the genocide you know, gets celebrated easily, uh, gets, again, talked about, spoken about, uh, you know, no April 24 marches and so on, until the last, you know, 10 years, which I'm gonna come back to uh, in a few minutes. And memories within, you know, intergenerational memories were also uh, very much suppressed, but this time from within the community, because of seeing the danger of, you know, getting punished, um, their parents, grandparents, would not tell their children about the genocide, either generally, or there is a, an un, you know, unwritten uh, rule uh, within the community that we have to wait for them to, you know, to be 18, uh, you know, mature enough, and then we tell them about what happened, uh, for them not to go outside and not to speak about it uh, with the other children and so that nothing happens to them. So uh, again, everything that goes beyond, you know, religious Armenian life is somehow suppressed, has been somehow suppressed. Uh, then there have been uh, limitations on links and identification with Armenian entities outside Turkey, uh, be that Armenia or the diaspora. So for decades, again, uh, and Talin Sujian in her book uh, shows this uh, quite uh, you know, in, in quite detail, how the Turkish authorities, with the help of Turkish media, you know, uh, you know, producing that hate speech and and pressure on the army, on the local Armenians, would do everything in order to somehow, uh, you know, cut any any any connections that the local Armenians could have with Soviet Armenia. For instance, during the repatriation waves that were organized, or you know, a repatriation of Armenians from from the global diaspora to to Armenia. Uh, and generally the diaspora. And of course, uh, community leaders, Istanbul Armenian community leaders would, would play into this, uh, and, and perhaps driven from, by, a, by a survival instinct, by uh, you know, straightforwardly denying and reject, rejecting, oops, and rejecting to be, rejecting to be associated with you know, the Armenian diaspora and so on and so on. Armenian flags, for instance, are something that are very common in Armenian schools in, in, in, in the US, Lebanon, in Syria, that is impossible to see in Armenian mm -hmm. schools in Istanbul, because that is beyond the permitted ar type of or permitted version of Armenians in the Republic of Turkey, which could be limited to the denomination, right? Don't go beyond that. So, ca religious categorization from above, and, and perhaps go back to Bes Besra and what she was saying, right? And trying to explain her stance by all this, through this historical, but also I'll come to the contemporary now, um, experiences they've been through. So, so religious categorization from above, Armenianness is a deem in the ID, at least in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Then um, religious discrimination, which, which further strengthens your, identi your identification as religiously different. Um, and then, as I said, suppression of trans-religious Armenianness. And on top of all that, there is on the everyday life, in the everyday life of Armenians of Istanbul, uh, what I call Christian Armenian experiential pairing. That is, they experience Christianity and Armenian is always in tandem. So one comes with the other, always. And because of the setting, because of the political and institutional setting in which they live, uh, and in a setting where they are not, for instance, permitted to have, you know, political, Armenian political parties uh, or political events. So the only means or the only channel through which Armenianness is maintained and is, you know, flows to them is 
is, is, is the church, is the Armenian church. And this makes their everyday experience you know, as children, as young children, as adolescents, and as you know, later on adults, of Armenianness always you know, imbued uh, with, together with, in tandem with Christianity. And so I, I invite you to join me now to, uh, uh, you know, to get, to, to imagine yourself as an, as an Istanbul Armenian child, ador adolescent child, going here. I say here because what is this? It's the church, but he goes here every single day because he's going actually to this building that is behind. It's the school. So this is how he goes or she goes to school every day. light is not perhaps letting you see but this is literally so this is the school and this is the church and they are literally uh, touching each other it was symbolic of course um, this is the entrance of the school not the church but see to what extent uh, there is religious symbolism in it because here lies the church on the left so this is how they enter and then just right after entering this is on the left um, it says that our school was established by the patriarch, so the religious leader uh, in, in, in Ottoman times. Um, and on the right, so right in front of this, there's this, which is, as I said, the only national flag permitted in schools. Uh, not, it's not about being permitted. You have to have this. Uh, otherwise, you're at least question why. Um, and then there is, this is, this is um, the statue of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Republic of Turkey. Um, and here, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the march of the Republic and then of, of Turkish youth. But then there's also something else that is permitted, is the Armenian Easter tree decoration. So you cannot have the Armenian national flag, but you can have the Easter decoration because that's within the permitted limits of Armenians. And I'll come to, back to this in a second, but see, this is taken from this, from this very classroom. Um, so you're, you're at the Armenian school, you're learning Armenian and other stuff, uh, but you always see this from outside the window. Now, you might say that this is also the case in other diasporic communities. That's true. There are also some schools that are literally adjacent to um, Armenian schools. But the difference is that this is the only way, or only possible way of having a school in Armenian school in Turkey. So there is there is no other option. Um, so there are, for instance, in Lebanon and in other. I, I, I bring the Lebanese example because I grew up there. You have schools that are adjacent and that are organized under the umbrella of the church, but you have also independent, secular churches where you can go and learn to be an Armenian uh, without going through the religious, you know, symbolism and ideology and. So that's, that's, that's, a, that's a key difference. And this class is also very important. I've attended this class as, you know, doing my ethnographic fieldwork. Ethnographic fieldwork requires you to go there, to be there, and to live like they do. So I attended some, some sessions, of course, not throughout the year. And I spoke with the teacher. Uh, and this class is called uh, Class of Religion and Morality, more or less, something like that. And as I said, there's no history of Armenia or Armenian history class. But what he does is he speaks about Armenian things when speaking about religion and morality. Because he covers, and they cover, the history of the Armenian church. And through that, they touch upon Armenian history. So they speak about the battle of Avarir, uh, of Vartam Mamionia. They speak about the Armenian kings. And when you speak about an Armenian king, you speak about an Armenia, which is only possible to do under the banner of a religious education, of course, okay? So th that is, and what he says is, I've interviewed him, and he says, my real motivation is not teaching them about religion or morality. I want to teach them about their Armenian history. I want them to learn that they come from, the, from, from this heritage. But he does that through this, and he's allowed to do that through this. Now, what's important for us is, from the perspective of the children sitting on this side, they are learning about Armenianness in tandem, organically tied up with history of the church and Christianity, right? As a result of which, one of them, Aren, who attended this school, says we are taught that we are a nation
that was sacrificed for Christianity. So nation, Christianity once again. And one last thing I want to, to say here is, again, which shows something I've noticed when visiting these churches. Uh, one, one Sunday, I, I would go as much as I could for the sake, again, of observing people and trying to understand them. And there was a kid, so usually most of Istanbul Armenians today, they speak Turkish within themselves, among themselves. Reasons for that, or well, one reason is Vatandaş Türkçe Konuş, the impact of that uh, throughout the decades. And so I've heard people who grew up in Malatya, for instance, and they would say, oh no, no, that was absolutely bad. And our parents stopped speaking Armenian at home. We were very young, we were, we were kids, so that we, we don't learn and we get used to speaking Turkish so that we don't, we don't go outside and playing with the Turkish kids and we don't speak Armenian there because it's bad. This, in, this has impacted um, the level of you know, knowledge and fluency in Armenian today. So many of the, uh, if not most, Istanbul Armenians speak, uh, they do know Armenian, those who have gone to the Armenian schools, but their everyday language is Turkish. Now, I entered the church and there was a kid and his mother, and the kid said, said something to his mother. And the mother said, meaning this is, this is the church speak Armenian. So again, to what extent in their cognitive you know, field and understanding of Armenianness and where does Armenianness belong to is tied to the church and to religion. So the church being the home of Armenianness. Again, because of their historical experiences, because when you could not speak up in Armenian in public, the only place outside your, your partner or your house where you could speak Armenian was the church. Because again, that was legally Legally, of course, these legal things were also not respected throughout the century. We, we saw the discrimination against them. But at least on the Treaty of Lausanne, officially, you were allowed to keep, you know, you were allowed to do what you want to do within the church, within the religious sphere. And so you could speak Armenian there. And so um, speak Armenian here. And that, think about that child. So I have to, okay, I, I speak Turkish outside, but I have to speak Armenian in the church. So being Armenian is actually about. Uh, speaking Armenian, but speaking Armenian is being in the church. It's, you do that when you're in the church. So, what is Armenianness if not fundamentally linked and tied to religion? And we're going to come back to this when we discuss their relations and their encounters with the Muslim Armenians who say we're not Christians but we're Armenians. And this leads, as I said, to what I call this Christian Armenian Coca experiential pairing and all the others lead to a Christian I mean cognitive pairing. In their cognition, these two really cannot be separated. Again, this is to some extent, you can find some manifestations of these amongst other Armenians living elsewhere. But the, the, the level that you find, the level that you see in Istanbul, among the Istanbul, Turkish Armenians, Armenians of citizens of Turkey, is way beyond. There is pairing and then there is sameness. And the sameness case is what you really, is very difficult to find, that's what I haven't seen. Um, so the pairing is, I, I, I put it in one quote, this is a quote from my interview with a young priest, whom I, whom, he, he, who was also cited by Besra in that graphic um, so, story, short story. He said, as Paul the Apostle has told us, we cannot separate the body from the soul. In an identical way, we cannot separate Armenianness from Christianity. Armenianness is the body, Christianity is the soul. They form an indivisible unity. So there is some differentiation here between the body and the soul, right? At least there are two different elements, but they're so inseparable, so indivisible. So that's pairing. But then there's also sameness for some people whom I've interviewed and for whom I've spoken. It's really the same. It's literally the same. And that is illustrated in this word, in this expression, hi oldu, meaning he became or she became Armenian. And so where did I hear this? Um, in, you know, once, several times, but I'll tell just one story. Uh, we were in Kanala Ada, it's this Kanala Island, um, which is majoritarily um, Armenian in the summer. Um, and then there was someone who was uh, telling about the uh, wedding of his uh, brother's daughter, his niece. Uh, and he said, yeah, um, the, you know, she married a Turk, but bef 
before marriage, the Turk came and got, got baptized. And so I will do. So not he became Christian. He became Armenian again. I find it very difficult to even imagine someone saying this in Lebanon, for instance. Um, I haven't heard this. Maybe there could be people. But this is not just one time. This is not one example. I've, I've, I've heard this. I've encountered this speaking about you know, becoming high um, just by through that act of getting baptized in the Armenian church because you're, you're there. So there's no there's no, no, no much need of other components of Armenianness. Uh, that is fundamental. That is fundamental and that is key. I've even interviewed a high-ranking priest in the Armenian church and I was discussing these issues and I wanted to, you know, wanted to challenge him saying that even if, I don't know, someone from China or from Africa who has nothing to do with neither the geography nor the history of Armenians comes and get baptized in your church, what does he become? Do you consider him an Armenian? He said, yes, I do. So again, um, this is within the context of the Republic of Turkey, where being Armenian is following that denomination, right? Belonging to that mezheb. So if you join, you get baptized in that church, you belong to that mezheb. So you're legally seen as an Armenian. You can then attend Armenian schools. If you haven't, if you don't have that baptism certificate, you cannot, because you, you are not legally considered to be an Armenian. That's why the Muslim Armenians cannot send their children to Armenian schools, because they're not legally Armenians. We're gonna come back to that. But the Chinese, you know, the, the, the, there's no such example. But if someone from you know anywhere else comes and just joins the church, becomes a member of the church, then he's legally an Armenian, I will do, and then you can go uh, or attend our schools. Very quickly, because I think I'm running short on time yet. Two or three slides left. Um, all these, this history of uh, you know violence, suppression, discrimination, also leads to another thing. So apart from the cognitive pairing of Armenianness and Christianity, another phenomenon or another important factor that is that plays also a role in relations with Muslim Armenians. Um, that's why I covered this as well here very quickly. It's the everyday politics of caution and, and invisibility, or tendency towards invisibility, as I call it, that you can see, or I could see, among the uh, contemporary Armenians of Istanbul. Um, and this is a result of that nonstop uh, hate speech, nonstop violence, and so on and so on. Um, this can be seen at least on three, three levels. One is you know, one, one way of um, trying to be invisible as an Armenian, and trying you know, to hide your Armenianness, literally, is uh, through relative isolation. That's one tactic or one strategy that I, that, that I came across. That is um, when you're going to buy an apartment or a house, you would try to um, go and you know, find an apartment in the Armenian populated neighborhood. I was looking for apartments to rent to rent places, and Armenians who were guiding me, they, they used to sell you know their apartment by saying it's all Armenians in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. There are no there are there there is none of them. The them the them is I'm gonna come back to the them here because mm -hmm. that's also in this logic. Mm -hmm. um, so you know let's let's be cautious. Let's let's let's let's try you know it's safer. I've even heard about grandmas, for instance, not you know telling their children who would go to universities. Don't bring them to our house. Um, so don't bring, if you, you're making friends with them, don't bring them here. Um, again, driven not by hatred, driven by fear, based on what they have gone through um, during these pogroms and so on. And of course the genocide and the whole post-genocidal context. Um, the second and very widely applied um, strategy is passing. So passing as a Turk or passing as a, as a Muslim. Um, there are, again, several ways of doing this. One is open denial. Uh, Sevak was killed. I'm quoting here uh, an Armenian young, young guy who served, you know, who, who did his military service. Uh, military service is mandatory uh, in Turkey. And there was Sevak Balic who was um, doing his military service and he was shot dead on April 24th, not a, not a coincidence, um, by the fellow, uh, you know, fellow, uh, fellow soldier um, who then was revealed to be connected with ultranationalist groups in Turkey. So this had happened, and then uh, this, this person called Alex uh, 
went and did his service. And he says, Zemak was, was already killed in the army just before I went to serve. That made me question whether it was worth telling anyone that I'm Armenian. I decided not to. One day a guy came and asked me, are you Armenian? Don't lie to me. Maybe he had heard me speaking Armenian on the phone with my mom, although I used to speak Turkish most of the time. And he would have done that in order for his Armenianness not to be you know, disclosed. I told him that I'm not Armenian, that I'm French. If you ask where I was scared, well, yes, I was. I value my life after all. So this is the most basic way of saying I'm Turk, I'm not an Armenian. Second, there's a whole set of, you know, I've done an analysis of Istanbul Armenian four names, first names. Um, it has its own, you know, sub, you know, categories. Uh, all, again, intended to somehow secure or defend the child from potential aggression because of being Armenian. So the most obvious way is giving him or her a Turkish name. Uh, very common are Jem, John, and so on. Especially generations that were born in the 1980s, which were particularly hard times after the coup d'etat, uh, military coup d'etat in 1980 in Turkey. Now that's the, more, the most you know, easy way. Then there are a couple of names that are somehow Armenian or can be interpreted as Armenian, um, but in reality are, you know, etymologically come from other origins. Like there are Sayat, Sayat. Um, now he can say it's Sayat Nova, right? And the Armenian poet and Ashu and musician and so on. So it has an Armenian link, but if, if someone in the army asks you, what's that name, Sayat? It's not like Hagok, right? You can say it comes from Arabic, it's Sayat, it means a hunt. Okay, and this, I'm not, I'm not, it's not my interpretation. The Sayat has spoken about this to me. He said, my parents wanted to call me Ararat, but then they said, no, let's not take the risk. And so Sayat is still somehow Armenian, it's culturally Armenian, Sayat Nova, right? Uh, but it's not Gomidas, because mm -hmm. Gomidas cannot be, uh, you know, it's, it's Armenian, right? And then there is even more interesting, I was fascinated by, when I started hearing Armenian names for the first time in my life, I've never heard these Armenian names, especially among uh, boys, I've, I've never heard elsewhere, but they are Armenian, they sound, they, are, they have Armenian meanings, but they're, there's, there's none of it in Armenia, none of it in the U.S., none of it in Lebanon. For instance, Burak. Burak means forest, small forest. Or Aikun. So I would ask them, what, what's that? So they'd say Aik. Aik is, uh, is the dawn, right? When the sun rises. Aikun, so at dawn. And it took me some time to realize that there's a Turkish name which is not Burak, but Burak. So the G and K difference. And then there's a Turkish name, Turkish name, not Aikun, but Aikut. Um, so these names are produced, the new Armenian repertoire of names produced in, in Istanbul under these conditions. When you have to give your, your Shah a name, you want him to be Armenian, you want him to have an Armenian name, but you want it, him to have a name that would not cause him problems at university <coughs> or especially when serving in the army during your military service. So if you call him Burak, a quite common name among Istanbul Armenians, it's Armenian, it has a meaning, it's beautiful. A little forest, right? But it's if you if he says, "What's your name, Burak?" Okay, Burak, and and it and it passes. Yeah. And then there's of course linguistic passing, a very famous, uh, very famous um, expression amongst the uh, Armenians of Istanbul is "Mama at home, Dunu Mama Tursa Anne, Mama at home, uh, Anne Agusa." So they would say they they would they advise their children not to call them Mama Agusa. Call me Mama when we're at home. Call me Anne, which is the Turkish version of Mama outside. And so I let you think about the psychological implications of these on the children themselves, right? Why do I have to hide you being my Mama outside? Because that's dangerous, my child. And at times, even really performing, you know, explicit performances of Turkish nationalism. For instance, and this I was told by an Armenian of Istanbul. He said, you know, when, when the uh, Turkish national holidays come, arrive, um, if you want to know where an Armenian lives in this neighborhood, just look at the balconies and wherever you see the flags, uh, the Turkish flags earlier, so these are the Armenians. Because Armenians are the first one who would go and hang the Turkish flags in order to perform Turkishness, in order not to be, you know, questioned, oh, you haven't, you know, where is your Turkish flag? Uh, because you're an Armenian, you, have, you don't have a flag, you don't like Turkey, you don't have the Turkish flag, 
we don't want that. We don't want that headache. So we do that performance. Similarly, all right. Then for maybe too many, too many stories now, and that's, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave that maybe to later if someone is interested to hear about the other story. And then the self self censorship is another thing which falls within this. They would self censor, hide their discontent uh, during even my interviews initially, uh, until a time where they got used to me and they started trusting. And they say, no, that's, we told you about these things. There's nothing. We're dealing very fine here. Mm -hmm. No, no discrimination. Why are you telling about? It? And then the same person, a few months later, would give me, a, you know, would speak about his own experience of how he got discriminated against. Um, again, of course, taboo topics, topics like genocide and so on, you cannot uh, talk about. I, I tell you just one example. I had done my interviews, and some of my interviews had spoken about soikara, using the word soikara in Turkish meaning genocide. And then there was more than 100 interviews I had. So I had to work with an assistant who would transcribe these interviews, some of them. Only the ones who had given per permission uh, for, for me to do that. And when she was uh, doing it, she did that, she did those, and she, uh, well, she called me and said, I cannot continue doing this. I said, why? She said, uh, she was like a 25 year old, perhaps young lady from Istanbul, Armenia. And she said, there, there are illegal things in them. I said, what do you mean by illegal things? It's, it's, it's, a, it's an interview. I've spoken to someone. Someone is sharing his opinions, his ideas, and his history and his story. No, I can't do that. I have to stop, she said. I said, OK. I said, I could, could you, could you at least send me what you have done? She said, yes. Uh, but she said, how should I send it? I'm afraid I, I, maybe emailing is, yeah. is dangerous, and so on. I said, OK, give it, give it to me on, on a USB stick. She gave it to me. I went home, I put it in my laptop, I opened it, and I see that the sentence is running, and I have screenshots of that if you'd like, and of course the recording, uh, the recording where you can hear the words, like, um, but then in the, in the uh, transcription, there's dot, dot, dot, dot, dot, yeah. and then I go and I check, and uh, dot, dot, dot, dot is the, the word, so, like, um, every time. so think at to what level this fear of being punished for transgressing your limits as a citizen of Turkey um, is, and finally, they don't use the word Turk when speaking about the Turks in Armenia during their interviews. Uh, because if you say Turk and the Turk is passing next to you, they can hear, and what are they gonna think? These Armenians are talking about the Turks, what are they talking about the Turks? That could be problematic. So some of them say Dajik, which is a word that is used for Turks in, in, the, global, in the global, I mean diaspora. It comes from Ottoman times, I guess. Uh, but some of them told me that even Dajik we've stopped, we've ceased to use because it's being, you know, uh, Dajikistan, and are we speaking about the Dajikistani Turks and so on? Um, that's also problematic. So Aylas is one term, and then there is them, simply them. So I read my interviews or listen to my interviews, and, uh, and so if one of them comes, who's the one of them? One of them well, is they are the Turks. So even not using the word Turk, but just, just changing it with them or they, Order, yeah, in order for to be uh, to remain on the safe side. So all this is also important when we come back to their uh, relations with the Muslim Armenians, because this also their politics of caution and invisibility also plays a role in their rejection or acceptance of them. I'll tell about that. Okay, just to end, um, what I spoke about, and this is my this is my last slide. What I spoke about is um, the general picture. Um, but it doesn't mean that each and every single army in Istanbul, you know, necessarily follows these strict rules of, you know, caution mm -hmm. uh, and of not transgressing the limits, the state imposed limits of Armenianness. Especially since the ninth, since at the turn of the century, early 2000s, there has been um, a growing movement within the uh, Christian Armenian community of Istanbul of pushing uh, what I call pushing the Jemaat limits. And pushing the Jamaat limits in two senses. Um, first, in both the political limits and the definition, definitional limits of Armenianness. So, and the, and the definition, I, I have it in bold here because that is also key for my next lecture, where you're going to see that people involved in these movements have a different stance towards the Muslim Armenians. Um, whereas the pushing the political limits is exactly challenging those state put political boundaries that suppress you know, Armenianness suppress trans-religious Armenianness, punish, and so on and so on. And these are just a few examples. Um, just in one sentence, this is the result of, 
uh, I will cover this in more detail next time, but this is the result of a broader contextual change within the Republic of Turkey at the turn of the century. There was this movement of democratization, which was then, uh, again, you know, forgotten about, and there was this movement of some, to some extent, liberalization, and the minorities gaining some leverage. Within that context, we have many, no, not many, few, but minority within the Christian Armenian community of really courageous people challenging the, the, the Turkish state's hegemony and nationalism, and going out to the streets even, and protesting, um, which would be unimaginable, you know, uh, before, these are a few examples, particularly Nor Zartong is the first ever political Armenian group founded in the Republic of Turkey, you know, not secretly, openly uh, doing politics. They have their organization. Um, and this is, for instance, a graffiti in the Armenian populated neighborhood. It's the face of Sevak, the soldier who was killed. Uh, and it's killed Sevak Kesbidich Morna. And then in Turkish, Sevak Ermeni Oldu Ichin Asker Sevak was killed in the army because of being, uh, for being Armenian. We're not gonna let you forget about this. And finally, the example of, of Garo Pailan, who speaks, um, who's a very vociferous you know, voice of challenging the Turkish uh, hegemonic political limits of Armenians. And I end by coming back to this. These people within these circles, there, are, there have also been challenges that to the definition and limits of Armenianness that would challenge the strict understanding of Armenianness that would uh, describe that as a means, as a politics of assimilation, of assimilating us Armenians, and that they would resist to. Uh, and so they would start saying that, no, we're not simply a Jamaat, we're not simply a Mezheb, we're not a denomination, we're not a religious, strictly religious community, we are more than that. Calling us strictly a religious community is in and of itself a form of oppression. We are an ethnic national group with our, our own ethnic national history, uh, and we're proud of that. And that is a key thing for, um, our, for us to understand the um, diversity of approaches towards the Muslim, to non-Christian Armenians, 